and um, as a distributor, what I'm finding at the moment, uh, the genres that are very hot internationally and that have worked really well for us is science and technology. And the, the reason why it works so well, you know, from, our, from viewers in Asia to Eastern Europe to Latin America and the US is that science is a very universal genre and, and the genres that tend to work very well um, is something that, you know, viewers from around the world can get. And on top of that, there's also wildlife as well, which is um, scenery resurgence. In the past, I'd say about four years, there's been an increase in wildlife again. Um, I think they're the two biggest genres right now, but in terms of factual entertainment, what we're finding that broadcasters, especially with the cable um, satellite broadcasters like National Geographic and Discovery, is that they're looking for character-driven programs. So what you see on television, like Porn Stars, um, which is on A&E um, at the moment, it was one of their highest rating shows, as well as Deadliest Catch. So it was, it's all about these people um, and about the personalities that drives um, these, these programs. A lot of lifestyle shows as well, because given the fact that emerging markets such as Asia and Eastern Europe, where you've got a lot of um, uh, pay TV broadcasters and digital terrestrial broadcasters, now um, cropping up. They tend to look for more lifestyle programs like your cooking shows and competition type formats. How many people have been to Cannes? Anybody? A few. Um, I guess I, I go to these markets, uh, I, I went to every single market in um, 2010 and last year I just went to Cannes and the year before that I went to a few. Um, there is definitely trends. Um, I think more Broadly, when I started, when I first did Wedding City, there was literally no sales. You know, I started in a period where the market was dead. Um, the good news is now the market is much more buoyant. I'm mainly focused in the, in the, in the feature film space, and that middle section, the trend seems to be there's a, the, the studio is making much less. They're making brand, branded, you know, their big brands, whether it's Superman for the 20th time or Batman for the 200th time. We're getting a lot of big, you know, that, that big stuff is coming out of the studio. So there's sort of room in the international marketplace for sort of entrepreneurial, ambitious producers working with big financing sales companies to make stuff to fill those studios' coffers for their local markets. So all the studios have distributors, you know, Fox, Universal, Paramount, they're all set up here in Australia. They need to buy content. Their studio is making less films than ever. So there's a bit of a space there where your big people like your Iron Globals or your exclusives or your New Millenniums or your big financing sales companies are triggering high budget films with massive actors. And then it feels like the other trend is sort of um, really on the micro budget, not micro budget, but lower budget level, high concept stuff is selling really well. Like not, not slasher stuff, like genre stuff, but you know, if you can, if you can I mean, it's always been the case, I guess. I've only been around for, you know, going to these markets for five, six years. But if you can, what, what seems to work is things that can, can sell on the, back of a, on the back of a cover in a couple of sentences that you can explain it easily. Particular, particularly when you've got high stakes, um, as in that the world is going to end, there's a nuclear bomb at the end of the, you know, there's a bomb that's going to blow up Sydney. High stakes. Great poster. Good poster, high stakes, and contained execution. That's really important for a low budget. So when I'm pitching stuff, I seem to sort of play in that space. We'll talk more about my, my business models a little later, but it seems that the trends in feature films anyway, um, to, to play in the middle is quite difficult, and you need to be very, you need, you need to have great cast and a low budget, but you know, the, the bigger end and the smaller end seem to be um, where the, the market is at. And you get some pit up at DCD who will read all the scripts and have a lot of notes on them. And there's, there's one sales executive at another distri distribution company who says he never watches the shows at all. And we go, is it much easier to sell them if you haven't watched them? Because <laughs> <laughs> you can say how wonderful it is and you're really blue. <laughs> anyway, um, there is a trend at the moment, it's split in two ways. They all would love volume, and yet volume is not what is being commissioned in the local market. Uh, so they tend to do that. What is happening a lot now is that's sort of eight, ten hours, up to thirteen hours, which is the cut off from any series for Screen Australia funding. They, I would either prefer that uh, or prefer um, uh, a big splash, a four-hour miniseries, or possibly a six-hour miniseries. For the last two years, no one's wanted to tell movies. Uh, they're very difficult to. 
pretty place apparently internationally. Uh, but the big four hour mini, which is precisely the hardest one to fund, um, is the one that they uh, want the most. Um, those ones tend to be driven by, uh, as I said, cast, 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 cast. The, the longer run where cast is less important, it can still be important. Uh, at the moment, they're saying what sells best internationally uh, shows made in Australia, oddly enough, shows made in Australia that couldn't be made anywhere else, uh, which is why things like, you know, Cloud's Daughters and the Sea Patrol that I mentioned before. Um, odd, of all Channel 9's dramas, for example, the one that sells the best is apparently The Strip. Oh, internationally, okay. yeah. <laughs> Gold Coast Cops, because for all that, yeah, risk. And it's... There, there's a... Sorry, I just told anecdotes. So stop me if you don't, but oh, okay, boring okay. anecdotes. There was, there was a time, apparently, in, in McLeod's Daughters where... And a lot of people work worked very hard on McLeod's Daughters, and as people always do in series and serial television, to try and actually make the stories work as best as possible when you're trying to shoot on a cattle ranch and border and that sort of stuff and create all the production problems and, and still do it in five or six days per hour. So they poured a lot of energy into it and they had the um, Hallmark uh, guys come out from America because it actually had started to sell well around the world. And they had all these people very proud that they're, they're working all their hours of effort to try and make the best drama they could. It was being recognised by the international distributors coming out who stood up and made a speech and said, and I just, you know, everyone should know that, you know, there's one real reason why this is selling around the world. It's just mindless entertainment. <laughs> and, so, and, uh, well, they said that as a positive. They said that as a positive. <laughs> yeah. And it, so, but there's, on the one hand, there's that aspect of TV drama. On the other side, there's things like the slap. So those sort of dramas are, are one side of what the Australian TV drama uh, industry is known for and is, is well known for. And then you either go that way or you go for it. Either and either want um, elevated genre. That's a that's a sort of quite strong thing. Or they want the big Sorry, budget. What does that mean? What does elevated genre mean? Yeah. Elevated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what you need to do. Um, yeah. No. It's, I mean, it's, it's high. Yeah, high concept with um, something new, something novel, something interesting. Um, looking deeper at character, going, uh, pushing beyond what people normally expect genre to be, but perhaps working at you know at uh, lower end budgets. Or using things that are abundant in Australia, like incredible cinematic uh, landscapes, and then using a you know doing a thriller, which people understand and audiences understand. And if, if audiences understand the genre that you're working in, they're likely to talk about it and see it. There's a lot of research to support that. Um, but taking that kind of template and making it interesting, making it new, making making it distinctive, um, that's you know that's that's a strong thing. At the other end, you've got budget. And that means you need cast, and you need to find out ways to get cast, and that's a whole another model that you mm -hmm. have to work to. Um, but I think the big message is avoid the middle ground, the soft, the soft drama, or things that are harder to sort of name and sell and explain to someone uh, that the market's not there for them. For a start, broadcasters want bulk. They want big series and big kind of landmark series, and they want like a lot of hours, and they want a series that can repeat with often recognisable faces and if you're trying to sell in the US market and your character is Australian they want somebody like Steve Irwin, you know they want a kind of crocodile hunter guy who's going to absolutely leap off the screen and, and um, you know be full of muscles, a sort of man versus wild, you know Bear Grylls type. Um, so you know it is, it is quite challenging. Um, Formats, as everyone said, are also really big in terms of, you know, the cooking, the dancing, the weight loss, weight gain, whatever shows are, are really, really popular. And it's finding new ways of, I suppose, telling that same story, finding new ways of creating a game show and, and so on. And there's, you know, there's, there's actually quite big money in formats if you can come up with, with, a, with an interesting format. And a lot of the distributors, I mean, every time you go to the markets, the first people that want to meet you are the distributors. They, because they don't want to miss out on something that could be really amazing. And the challenge is getting money out of the distributors if they like your idea. I mean, I basically will not work with a distributor unless they're prepared to put in an advance on my project. Um, because, you know, why? Why? give your idea to a, to a distributor to sell unless they're prepared to really commit to it financially. 
Um, animals and wildlife is really big. I mean, animals and wildlife sell everywhere, and so does science, really strong science stories. Um, I've tended to work much more with public broadcasters and then with the cable channels like Discovery and National Geographic. Um, even all the public broadcasters now are really moving away from um, commissioning singles, single one-hour doc docs. They are, they are all after series, and you'll see this is happening in Australia as well. I mean, both SBS and ABC are commissioning pretty well 75% of their commissions are going to series now rather than to single one-offs. So, so when you're talking about series, I was interested that the Penguin series was half hours, because generally series are an hour. How did you go pitching and selling a half hour series as opposed to an hour series? Well, one of the things that I tend to do is I will, you know, I'm a bit of a whore in the sense that you pretty well give them... We all are, just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make that so really if, if you say, look, this is six half hours, and they go, By hour, you know, half hours won't work, or we can do three one hours. So you immediately... <laughs> You know, flick it and say, well, we can give it to you as, you know, three. We can we can actually make a one-hour version if you like. But we try not to. If you, if you just say, we'll make a one-hour version, then maybe they'll only take that rather than the whole series. But certainly with with penguins, we did four versions. Of All right, so you so you packaged it as an hour as well. So with different markets and even with the distributor, we delivered them three different versions, so they could sell it in the international market. In you know, they can cut it in many different ways, and we're doing the same with with Devil Island. Exactly. And pretty well, all of ones I do, you know, will often be delivering three different versions. Uh, that's other people said about you know, relationships with commissioning editors. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, we're yeah, we're there the whole time. And, and yes, you can influence them with good ideas. It's not as though, because if, if, if they knew exactly what they wanted, they could go out and make it. And that come to you. Yeah, and that's happened. <laughs> but, um, but there's also parameters in which you sort of look at their schedule, look at their budgets, look at what they want, try and match that up with you know, what you know the international world is looking for, um, look at time slots that are available, look at their demographics and where they're actually low. There's all sorts of things you've got to actually match up, um, not just you know, Coming up with a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it needs both. But but as I said, it, it's that's not that sort of you know show business. Um, it's been the same since ancient Greece. But you know one of the reasons why you know, I've stayed in television is because that's that's where I've been able to tell most of the stories I want to tell. So in the last ten years, as I was just jogging and get lots of people to see it. Well, it is. I mean, my husband, my killer, three series of NBA, Jessica, Society of Moody's. Society Murders, five series of Underbelly, three telly movies of Underbelly, The Informant, Force Witness, Crown, His Brothers and Arthur Fowl Street. <laughs> now, not many feature makers could make that much, could Con tell that many stories yeah. in a decade. Yeah. Now, there's a cost for that, but there's also a pleasure in doing that. A lot of the broadcasters like the shows that you've probably seen on television, like Big, Bigger, Biggest, you know, where they actually sh show moving, you know, huge objects, you know, whether it's animals or building bridges or, you know, some enormous silo that has to, you know, travel. And, but that, that tends to skew mail. And a lot of those sort of science shows, the broadcasters really, in particular Discovery, you know, they have quite a strong mail audience. So they're really looking for that kind of mail skewing program. Pop, the sort of pop science is really popular. Um, I mean, Big Brother was first commissioned as a science show, so that kind of pop science, as in you know people's feelings or how people live together. The ABC commissioned a series about <laughs> making Australia happy. They did three one hours on that uh, a couple of years ago, and they've commissioned another series, making couples happy, and that's been commissioned through their science um, their science strand. So that's that sort of you know. It's almost lifestyle, but it is sort of pop science. Um, there's always a fascination with anything to do with medical stories, um, the human body, the brain, um, you know, new kind of discoveries, new insights, and in particular using a lot of, of computer graphics is really, you know, popular for those kind of stories. Travelling inside the body, you know, getting some sort of insight into how we work. And then even science event television, such as I know Channel 4, a couple of years ago, did a, a live autopsy, um, you know, which it's made a lot of noise and you Is know. Is that a contradiction in terms of live? 